How are you doing? Doing quite well. Nice to meet you. There we go. All right, I have you expanded. Fan of your work. Like, really, really great stuff. Um, you know, I just wanted to say thank you so much for joining my life. Well, I, I think you and I are on the same page with talking about facts, backing them up, doing our part. For me, it's about resilient democracy and information. For you, um, it's, it's about really having the examples and the numbers behind what you're saying. It's really important. Yeah, like, I mean, the feelings are great, but you also, when you're going to start making assertions, you should have facts to back them up. That just, and I, I think that with the, with just the way social media spreads like wildfire, people don't even double check. They, they just, they just say, oh, well, this person's speaking with conviction. I guess it must be true, or I want it to be true. So, or I'm afraid it's true. So it's probably true. And uh, it's, um, I mean, it's, it's really interesting because I could just say whatever I want without backing any of the facts and people will just start believing it. And that's sad, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And often I tell people, people say, oh, D Dr. K, thank you so much. I appreciate this. You know, you're the only one I can trust. And I say, don't trust me. Yeah. This is the problem. I don't want you to trust me. Yeah. I want you to learn the signs you should be looking for to know yep. if someone is providing reliable yep. information. That's why I, I have, sorry. No, you first, you talk, you go. I, I was just going to say, I have confirmation bias. I, uh, through yeah. my experiences, I, and I don't know how much you know about the last few years of my life, but in February, 2022, I drove out of Kiev. And of course that affects how I see uh, the Russian, the full-scale invasion that started in 2022, because it directly wow. affected. Oh, you didn't know that. This is one of the reasons I talk so much. And this is great because this is a really authentic conversation. I, I also didn't like dig into your social media because I thought I'd just let this conversation same. naturally happen. Yeah, I, I'm the same way. Like I, I'd like to think, I'd like to get to know you by talking. You okay, know? yeah. Um, so, but wow, wow. Oh my gosh, that must have just been like so. That must have been surreal. Like, is this really happening? Is this is this actually going on? You know, like, I mean, go ahead, you tell me, because just I'm I'm still in a little bit of shock. I've had a lot of time to think about this, and <laughs> I, I want to first qualify that I don't like to leverage off this experience because there's so many people that have had such a terrible time. Yeah. friends of mine, colleagues of mine in Ukraine. But it is something that when you hear someone that experience it firsthand, it does have a value. Mm -hmm. So I've had time to think about this. And I've also have uh, a core group of people around me that share this experience with me and I've kept them close. Mm -hmm. And probably the best analogy is when you wake up one day and gravity's not working anymore. <laughs> because all of the givens that you've accept, uh, accepted in life and how the world works and how the international system works and how safety works um, and, and how modern warfare should work. You wake up and your world has changed. And it's you have to figure out then in a very, very short time how you're going to deal with this new situation. Now, by the time Kiev was attacked, I was already in safety, okay. but I also got to see how this this shift in reality yeah. aff uh, affected people on such interesting levels. Um, it was frustrating for us on the outside, you know, d texting, calling people, trying to top off mobile co mobile phones, just trying yeah. to help people who were leaving the city or needed to find out where a gas station was or or needed to find out where a bus was. Um, some of my my husband's colleagues, we found out from our dining room table because we were in an Airbnb by that time that they were in the same city. No, they were on the same train. And we said, oh. you know, she's there. And they ended up, you know, just kind of work friends. They ended up walking 13 kilometers together wow. um, after the train got them close to the Polish border. And, and we followed them. And when they got across the border, we made sure someone was, was there to pick them up. But it was um, to see how people reacted when that yeah. shock happened, because 
many Ukrainians are decent yeah. people. They're, yeah. they're, they're very, um, and it seems like an odd way to describe it, but they, they did not want to accept that things were breaking down. So initially when Kiev got attacked, um, they weren't running to the train station. They were first going online to see if they could buy tickets because that's what you do. And yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh, you're right. It the, took a couple the, hours for people. The illusion to of say, safety. Yes, that that things are working, and also that you know what do we do in these situations? And you know you go to the train station with a ticket, and you wouldn't just get on a train. And um, watching these things though from afar, going you know you know what's going to happen. You know, so, I, I should have I should have okay so. Um, first, tell us what were you doing in Kiev? Like, tell us your credentials. So, tell us about, <laughs> you know, how well, awesome you are. This is going to make everyone think that I'm tied to the CIA. But yes, I yes, they say I am. Everyone swears I'm a Fed, and I'm like, I wish. I'm sure the pay is great. Just, just hey, they know where I live. They just send me a check. Zell me, hey CIA, go ahead. Yeah. Um. I have a strict rule about applying, uh, um, replying to trolls on social media, and I've, yeah. I don't anymore. But my response was always like, "Just let send me the money." Then, if that's true, yeah. Um, I'm I am a political scientist. I um, have my focus in international relations. I wrote my dissertation on small states and power disparities. And that also, um, as a woman, was a topic that was very clear to me because often times women have to negotiate from a disadvantage. And I looked at especially the Baltic states, Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. I had a Fulbright scholarship there. I did my research, got access to a lot of interesting Latvian um, politicians wow. um, around 2006. And if you'll remember, Remember, that's when the NATO expansion wave was happening and mm -hmm. and Latvia got into um, NATO and Ukraine was lobbying for it and in you know 2008 they were given false hopes but this was kind of in this period um, after getting my uh, PhD I I have a family and I um, I had worked in Berlin at the uh, German parliament and at the German Council on Foreign Relations. And uh, I ended up outside of Frankfurt. Oh. And then eventually I spent six years in New Delhi, India. Whoa! Um, working Very in cool. cooperation, doing communications product, projects. And that's kind of, I got into political communication um, and how people are communicating with each other. And I had worked with politicians always, and you have a lot more credibility when you can say, I know what this is like. Yeah. And when I was in Kiev then, um, in 2018, we moved there. Uh, they were looking for a news anchor at the state-run television station, UATV. Wow. And with my Midwestern accent, I uh, had no problem getting the job, and I, I've i always been a news buff. I'm sure you have been too. You know what it's like. You know, if yeah. you're, if you're watching the news anyhow, being part of making news is really interesting. And I spent uh, about two years doing that, um, and then President Zelensky basically fired me. Uh, oh! <laughs> I, I love telling the story like this. This is what they call a good hook on social media. Yeah. Actually, Actually, at the time, Zelensky had won with 73%, and he recognized that there was an information war going on. And I mean, as someone involved in media, he thought the best thing you can do is to meet people where they are and speak their language. So he wanted to shift a big part of the state TV's budget that was for English programming um, into Russian language programming, um, which, I mean, you hearing me say this, all of this 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 myth that you know it's so anti-russian language and discriminatory in yeah. ukraine um it was an absolute myth I'm, I'm someone that basically lost my job because russian was being promoted and they focused a lot of their news then in russian towards the east and that was really important because the most russian-speaking news that people in luhansk and the Donbass were getting was from Moscow, right? Yeah. So that obviously had a slant. So after uh, leaving UATV, I went to Hormatska and had a TV show, a weekly political TV show in English. Um, wow. 
but you know what probably my biggest claim to fame and then i'm going to stop because i kind of feel braggadocious here was I, I was involved in the first trump impeachment hearing because Yay! yeah unintentionally you know how i said i started working for the tv station in 2019 mm -hmm. i think it was my second or third interview um i was sent to meet with gordon sundland who was oh, yeah. EU ambassador, yeah, and he yeah. showed up in Kyiv. And, you know, as a political scientist that had also done a lot of, you know, comparative diplomatic um, studies, I asked my colleagues, why is he here? He has no mandate. Yeah. And he's, oh, you can't ask him that. That's such a lowball question. And he's an absolutely kind and charming person. Sure. And he sat down with me and I did just ask him that. I said, what are you doing here? Yeah. And I didn't know, but I think it was July 25th, and he had just gotten off a very loud telephone call with Donald Trump in a restaurant in Kyiv where they talked about the quid pro quo. And, oh my gosh, wow. And he announced to me in this interview that he was given a special mandate, and he was one of the three amigos. I think it was Kurt Volker at the time himself and somebody else, and yeah. they were going to take care of the Ukraine situation. And I came back to the studio from um that interview which was done in a, in a hotel and i said to my colleagues you know i haven't been doing this very long everyone was so tense all of his minders were so tense he was absolutely relaxed and they're like oh mm -hmm. that's odd and hindsight is always 2020 in november then so months mm -hmm. later someone in the states i think it was rachel maddow actually mm -hmm. dug, dug up this interview and I woke up to having like my 10 seconds of fame. Nice. Uh, because the interview was shown and I still have a copy of it somewhere. The interview was referenced as evidence in the impeachment hearing. Yeah, you gotta put that up. You should also, so you should put that on your TikTok, but you should also just say, I don't know if you've done this, just say, I got fired by Zelensky. Like literally just say, I got <laughs> fired by Volodymyr Zelensky. I'm not taking it personally, you know, like just something like that. I mean, because I, I think that would really go well. People would be like, what? It goes much better when you have these personal interactions like this. Um, I've used that in a radio show. Sometimes I'm asked to come on a radio show um, in the Midwest to kind of explain what's going on in Ukraine. Wow. And I opened with that once and it got me got me some credibility. Sure. But, you know, it's interesting when you say that, like, most people don't really know what's going on in Ukraine. Like, uh, like most of the people I've met who, I mean, like I'm in Trump country um, and they really believe they, 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 they did not know about Ukraine until really the war happened. They just thought Ukraine was a part of Russia. A lot of these people, you know, they're like, oh yeah, you know, it's just becoming a, you know, if, like, I don't want to say the word cause I could get censored, but N-A-Z-I, you know, oh, it's just that kind of zine. And it's like, what are you talking about? You know what I mean? Like, no, it's like there is maybe, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I think this this one expert, like the, he's a guy, he's like the North American consultant for just this kind of thing. And he was like, maybe in any election in Ukraine, like a 3% vote, voter turnout was that. Yeah. You know? But in Russia, there are much more concentrated. There's a much higher concentration of that kind of element. Yet nobody talks about it, you know, or, or it just... Um, like, or they say, oh, well, the people in Donbass and Luhansk, the Russians were actually, they were getting attacked and they were, you know, being oppressed. And it's like, I've, I've never, I've never read one story on any news source about people in, in Luhansk or Donetsk being attacked because they were ethnic Russians. You know what I mean? Like, I just, um, it's, it's really it's like what we talked about earlier. It's just people, it doesn't even need to be true. It just needs to be said with conviction and it just spreads. Yeah. Right. I mean, like that's probably, are you, were you, is that what you witnessed when you were in Ukraine, when you were working there? Well, considering that the topic of hybrid warfare, misinformation and disinformation, mm -hmm. the Ukrainians have been watching it and have been aware of it much longer than it's been even a topic. Mm. In Western Europe, in North America. Yeah. So I was aware of it, and there they were specializing in uh, already the the pre bunks. Are you familiar with this topic? This this yeah. kind of the pre bunks. They were they 
the Surikov papers, those were um, email leaks from one of Vladimir Putin's um, advisors came yeah. out and I covered that a little bit also and got to do interviews with people that looked at the information. And I learned about things like reflexive control. When you study someone or a group of people so mm. long, yeah. you don't you don't force them to do anything, but you create a situation where the they will react a certain way and it mm. is to your favor and the the ideas of, of fake news and people influencing the media and framing a narrative it was something that was it's been talked about for at least 15 years in that area wow world. man it's okay oh so speaking of that and, and i do want to eventually go to like you know the new cold war we're in but one big point that a lot of people try to make is that, well, you know, um, Ukraine had a democratic election where they, what, what was it, Lukashenko? No, not Lukashenko. I forget the guy's name. But, you know, like he was like he was the pro-Russia president. I, I, I'm sorry to forget his name. Okay. You know what? And it's tough. And I struggled with these names. Lukashenko is, is Belarus. Is Belarus. We had Yanukovych. Yeah, Yanukovych. Okay. And then, you know, into in 2014 the ukrainian people stood up against it and they had a new election and there are so many people even even like pro-communist people on this app who are saying that that was unlawful u.s involvement to okay. overthrow the government and if, you, if you're not deep into that you'll you'll hear people talking about cookies or vicky victoria newland oh who, yes um and piat jeffrey piat yeah and or Priyat, this, Priyat, or Priyat, i forget his last name this is really um a way of discounting what the ukrainians did yes and i i don't know um i don't live there anymore so i'm going to talk about where i grew up i grew up in north dakota okay mm -hmm. and the winters there are very very cold and ukrainian winters are similar it's a continental climate it, it can go minus 30, 40. There's a wind chill. Skies can be blue, but it can hurt your teeth when you smile. I and, lived in South Dakota, so I, okay. yeah. So, and these people, these Ukrainians, yeah. stood out in the winter um, outside through the night for months as a political protest. Wow. And it is, um, if, it is not something that I think you could be easily convinced to do, especially not just for a few biscuits yeah. that diplomat. Yep. yep. And and let's just not discount the fact that Russia has a history of aggressive expansionism stretching from the 1500s to today. They are always attempting to expand their borders. And I hear so many foolish people say, oh, well, Russia's already the biggest country in the world. They don't need more land. Yes, they do. They want arable land and they will also want access to ports. That's, yeah, uh, that's you know, always the goal. If Russia could take the entire world, they would, because it's not like they're thoughtful or actually tactical. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, no, I've got Tim Marshall's book, The Prisoners of Geography. And it's, you know, it's, his, I think this came out in 2014, and he talks mm. about the importance of the warm water ports for Russia. Yeah. So if anyone wants to understand that, Tim yeah. Marshall, Prisoners of Geography. And um, what does Crimea have? A warm water port that the USSR used to benefit from. It just, it's like, and, and not just that, it's like, I, I don't know enough about Belarus, but I, I've been to Ukraine, I've been, I've been to Poland, I've been to a lot of Eastern European countries. Everyone was afraid of Russia. And this is even in 2008. Everyone was afraid of Russia and did not want Russia near. They wanted to get into NATO because they knew it was only a matter of time before Russia would come in and try to take everything again. And people say, well, you know, I, I think some fool on my live is like, oh, well, how would you feel if some hostile alliance, you know, was encroaching along your borders? It's not a hostile alliance if that country has defensive nato is defensive yes nato doesn't ever stage attacks to, to and and then keep more land you know whenever nato like when, when nato supported us in iraq or or even in afghanistan eventually like we like it wasn't nato land we it was not u.s territory we did not annex it you know what i mean and that's just it's just 
the, the, these people, they just don't, they, they don't understand the difference. There's NATO, which is an alliance, and Russia, which is a country. And Russia well, seeks to expand its borders. It's hard. Let's just be honest. It's hard when you've accepted something and someone tries to tell you otherwise. I know. And yeah. it's really who gets there first in some ways. Yeah. Yeah. Who gets there first and who makes you feel better? So would you agree that we're in a second Cold War? But I feel like it's not Russia and America pulling the strings. I feel like it's America and China. And Russia is kind of fulfilling a lot of China's interests. You know, I thought about this because um, you said maybe we'll talk about the second, you know, the Cold War. From, from my expertise, I would love to approach this from looking at it as truly a second Cold War. Mm. Because if there's not an active kinetic war, mm -hmm. diplomacy takes on such a relevance. Mm -hmm. And we've seen a lot of indications of old diplomatic tricks being used again. Mm. Think about the amount of diplomats that are being expelled or named persona non grata. Yes. About the, the Poles um, summoning the Russian ambassador, a diplomatic summons to the to the, mis the to the foreign ministry is something that means a lot, and and in the past had a lot of weight diplomatically, and we see a lot of this, and I could I could argue and I could show examples, but I think it's not a Cold War. Why? Wow. I, I think we needed to find war new because war isn't just kinetic anymore. And this wow. is part of the problem with NATO right now, because NATO countries are being attacked, just not in the way that NATO traditionally defined. Like war. cyber warfare and info warfare and like economic warfare. Yep. Yep. All right. That makes sense. I mean, that, you know, but the thing is, it's when I think of NATO, Sometimes when I think of NATO as a group, I kind of think of them as a body without a head. But then, of course, there's the United States. And Just I think one second, I haven't really. I'm I'm having a tough time reading the comments, but someone just sure. Max and just commented two legends in one stream, and <laughs> just made my day. Okay, uh, thanks, Max. <laughs> Max, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah, you know, Karistocracy is pretty amazing. Kudos, you know, hats off to her for for the great content. And, and th everyone thank her for, for joining me on the interview. And everyone, please, if you're not following her already, please give her a follow. She deserves to have a million followers. So <laughs> I don't know if I want them, though, okay? <laughs> uh, it's true. It, honestly, it, it gets, like, I get about, like, uh, sometimes I'll get, like, a thousand comments in a day. And I try to sift through them, you know, but a lot of them are F you, go to hell, hate you, screw your family. It's like, okay, you know, <laughs> It's it's true, and I don't even have a million. I have like close to a quarter million, you know. But but still, I I want I want you to get recognition and traffic, you know. But I I, I want to let go back to um. Oh, okay, so like I think of NATO as a body without a head sometimes, just because of how they move. But then there's the U.S. and the U.S. does a really good job of looking like this bumbling giant oaf that doesn't know what to do with its own hands. But I don't believe that for one second for the sheer fact that the United States has managed to always, not always, but for the past at least 80 years, like get, get, like get the advantage, like always come out on top. Like, I mean, I remember as a kid, like everyone kept saying that it's only a matter of time before the Soviets like take us down and then boom, the Soviet Union fell. And then it was only a matter of time before Japan outgrew us economically. And then boom, something happens with Japan. And now I'm hearing the same thing with China. It's only a matter of time before. And I just, I think that the United States does so many different things. And I think they do a lot of it secretly to, you know, that kind of allows them to keep their advantage. I mean, when I looked this up, I was like, I, I looked up, I was like, who are the worst hackers? Like not the worst, but the, you know, who are the most skilled hackers in the world? What country produces them? And America was like number two. And I was like, what? But it's like, we wage a lot of cyber warfare. It's just a lot of times we don't get caught. Like I, I read, and I even, even before like the internet, I remember reading, um, this was a while ago, but when the United States and England began to cooperate with the, the USSR during World War II, 
we hesitantly exposed them to our intel. And Stalin was horrified because of how deep we got in. Like one of the reasons why he put the Iron Curtain was because of how deep the US and the UK infiltrated, you know, into, into almost everything. That's, that's why there were out of the 700,000 people at the KGB working in the 60s or 70s, almost half of them were just in Russia and the rest were around the world. I mean, so I think, I don't know. I, I, think, I think that the U.S. kind of is like, is kind of like the most Machiavellian, but we don't appear that way. We, we, we go for this semblance of trying to do good, but I think, you know, we have the CIA, we have all of, the, all of these other, you know, interests that that's somehow managed to keep us at a higher advantage than other countries. I think that is a viewpoint spoken up from the luxury of, I'm assuming, being in the United States. Yes. Because last time we had a war in our territory was? 1865. And there are other areas, major regions of the world that don't get the warm fuzzies when they talk about the United States, right? Oh, most so, of the world. Most of the world. and. If you'll think back to about two weeks ago, there was a state dinner, um, state visitors um, from Kenya. And yeah. this is part of the United States efforts to engage now in Africa too. Catch up. China and Russia is taking up a lot of space there. Yes. And it's, um, I don't know if China and the United States are really if it's going to be a true bipolar system going back to like this whole idea of cold war and having um i i think that it's um it won't be easy to define until we can look back on mm. develops okay so you mean because china and the us are still so tied in together economically I, I think that, you know, you it's comfortable to talk about the idea also of Cold War because it's an idea we're familiar with and we're yeah. going to uncharted territory, right? Ah. We're, we're talking about hybrid warfare. We're talking about economic warfare and that includes sanctions. We're talking about um, not knowing what the real truth is, different versions of the truth everywhere. This is a situation that is new. I can't That's think of it. There are um, times when when gravity goes away. You know, you know when... that's a really good point. I, I kind of was thinking of an old mind frame where, oh, we're becoming multipolar, and but this is just uncharted territory. Maybe this is just how the world is going to be, and it's not multipolar, maybe because we've globalized too heavily. Yeah, but... Uh, yeah. I was I was telling a friend of mine that we were we, I was going to talk with you and you want to talk about the Cold War, the new Cold War, maybe. And they pointed out that the Cold War was about ideology, right? Yeah. It was about capitalism or we could freedom and yeah. and communism and and it's not about ide ideology anymore. What's happening? You've got autocratic leaders. Mm -hmm. that don't have anything in common from what they believe, right? Mm. Um, but it's, you know, just a couple guys, well, it's all guys that have had bad days and um, want, want to keep on the power. And then there is the other side that says, that's not okay, that we don't want that. We don't, we don't want that to be the norm in the world. We don't want just some uh, crazy ass guy to be able to set the tone for everybody. And this is where it's also, mm we have the habit and it's very comfortable to use frameworks to help us understand theoretical yeah. but there's there's not much there and as as an american it's always um interesting you got to stretch your frameworks too and this is why You're i made up right. of saying you know america's not liked everywhere and there are people that would prefer to have russian or chinese influence i agree i agree Af i think Especially africa i think no i'm sorry if i made it sound like everyone loves America. No, I think America, we, we do come out on top, but it's not because we're so nice. I think we come out on top because we, we have our foot on so many necks. 
Yeah, and it's easy to feel like you're coming out on top if you don't have gunshots or um, yeah. the missiles or you don't have any of the danger. It's you're watching yeah. watching this as Americans and we're like, yeah, we're coming out on top. This is working out pretty good for us. Yeah. And um, it has, you're right. It has worked out for us. Yeah. The, the, I mean, the reason why it's worked out for us is because we're two, we're an ocean away from Europe. We're an ocean away from from China. You know, our northern and our southern borders are friends. You know, I, I mean, and we, we, we are completely food, energy and like steel independent. We are we are also becoming more independent when it comes to like semiconductors and precious, like not precious metals, um, rare earth metals. So like we like seriously, this this continent is blessed with like all these resources and a growing population, which is more than, you know, Europe and most of Asia can say. Um, but again, I just mean that I just mean that America plays kind of plays an oath, but I think they're kind of like the powers that be are kind of like Darth Vader emperor esque. And there are, we, we have, I, and I know we donate a lot of money to a lot of countries, but we have caused a lot of havoc. We've caused a lot of havoc in South America. We've caused, we've at least at the very least permitted a lot of havoc in, in Africa. But we, I don't think we ever should have gone into Vietnam. Like there is just, you know, I mean, I don't think we needed to throw away American lives. And I've listened to so many interviews with like former Vietnam vets. And the more I listen to the interviews, I'm like, we never should have been there. We never should have been there. And, and all the innocent people that, that we, that, that are, that America butchered or, and tormented and did everything to, to do what, to prevent this, to prevent the spread of, okay. And I, ideology they didn't like, but what was there before? you know, French imperialism, which should have died, you know, and unfortunately, French imperialism is still alive and strong with like, what, how many 12 different African countries that are still former French colonies that still rely on their currency to be printed by France. But they're, they're, they're having problems in Africa. And I mean, and the Wagner group and, yeah. and Putin took advantage and have destabilized that, you yeah. know, whole colonial. Well, so go, going to Africa, you know, like, I mean, like, I think we're playing a risky game of catch up with, with trying to woo Africa. Do you think it's possible that the U.S. can, can gain any further favor in, in, you know, these dozens of African nations or, or what? I don't know if it's about gaining favor. I think it's mm. maybe about making up for the past. Because you know, America has also a long history of exploitation. Yep. And Africa is a growing country. Yes. Um, so many emerging economies. Yeah. And they're going to be really setting the setting the tone, maybe, for what happens in the rest of the world. And. Yes, I agree with you. Mm -hmm. And. An unstable Africa would mean an unstable world. And I think that is why it's important to, mm. to be present in Africa. Yeah. And it's not just about fighting. Water is gonna be such an important thing in the next 20 years. And there are countries in Africa that are making sure they get theirs. Yeah. Looking beyond their borders. And that's gonna cause tensions. And you know, you've said it yourself. We're lucky in America. We have yeah. friendly neighbors, and it's bountiful uh, resources. But but we're also uh, you know guilty of abusing those resources too, yeah. right? It's yes, like absolutely. No, I, America again. We we are like I I think I think in a lot of in a lot of cases we are kind of the bad guy, but I think when it comes to the very powerful countries, we are the least bad, bad guy. I mean, it just, I, I don't, I, I mean, seriously, like, I don't think Russia, Russia, I know, I think it, with Russia being the leader of, of, you know, like the free world, I think that would be a, a, a disaster. I, I also think. China, well, it wouldn't be the world anymore if Russia was the leader. Sorry. Yeah. And I think China as well, because I, I think it just, you know, it, they, they believe too heavily in control, you know, in, in, controlling the market i mean they they they, they have ex 
they they like the fact that they have banned what 60 companies 60 american companies from operating there i mean like facebook instagram tumblr you know um pinterest just uh, i mean uh, whatsapp reddit no i don't think because china in charge of the world means means like a, a lack of the free flow of information and capital you know so then who else who else is there japan no i'm still i'm still raw about japan from world war ii because they were horrible they, they they made very clear what they wanted to do you know what i mean and it'll take several more generations for that to be kind of like ah uh, you know so so who else who are you else? ready for germany are you ready for, to forgive germany every, every you know you can't be hard i was i was gonna say no i'm not um my father was rounded up by the by them he's alive he got a, like his uncle got him out uh, yeah exactly i'm not ready like my wife is jewish my wife is jewish and her family is they're russian jews and you know they they were they were almost rounded up by the, by that party but one german lady snuck them out she was a soldier but she got them out because they were kids she she you know like by the grace of you know whatever force in the universe so it's like to no i don't i don't i don't think any of those countries so it's like okay i guess we go back to america the one who dropped a nuclear bomb twice <laughs> you know but they, they're the least they're the least bad england no england and the thing is like i i have nothing against the english people but english history it's like the germans were horrible for a couple decades the german the, the english were horrible for like three four centuries man but very rarely within their own borders very rarely within their own borders but still that's pretty you know i mean what they did to india nigeria ghana it, it's it's um so i just think i th i just think that what 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 makes america so terrifying is what makes it the least bad bad guy it's like it just seems like like the powers that be and I'm not saying the president or anything. I mean, like the, the the money powers. It's like they really just want profit and business. And if there's something that inter interferes with that profit and business, then then whatever it is, good or bad for the rest of the world, then that will be mitigated. That'll be taken apart. You know, World War Two, Germany was bad for world trade. So boom. You know, World War One, Germany was, <laughs> I guess, bad for world trade, and then. And you know more than this, more about this than I do. It's just, this is my limited perspective. First of all, don't ever say you have to stay in your lane with anyone. One of my, one of the things I really like to talk to people about is everyone should talk about politics. But I want to circle back to what you were saying about, you know, money motivating. Mm -hmm. And let's look at this now from what also makes things more difficult for people that want to make money mm -hmm. and it's well-informed society it's a society that says that's not something that i approve of uh, and i have agency and i know you know where to get information that's correct and mm -hmm. this is a huge problem in the united states education and now we can compare ourselves also with the uk yeah. i've talked about this on other platforms before margaret thatcher yeah and Margaret same, Thatcher what? I'm sorry. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan at about the same time in both countries. Yeah. Densely cut educational spending or passed off the responsibility to other places. And it takes about a generation for it to really kick in. But we have a lot of stupid people. We had <laughs> Yes. Forgive yes, me. Yes, you're right. Had people that in the UK accepted the lies that were being fed to them about Brexit. We have people in the United States that are more comfortable with the terrible conduct of politicians because they believe their some other goal is being reached that will benefit yes. them. Yeah. And they're not taught how to analyze. They don't know where to get their information. And I'm sorry that I'm using they because I don't want to create an otherness but, here. But it's you're just, right. It's a shared experience here because we all have to deal in society with everyone, regardless of their le uh, level of education or how much they want to inform themselves. So it's not a question of them and us, it's a question of how are we gonna handle this? And 
I just don't understand why. Well, I do understand. I said dumb people are easy to control and influence, and this is why. Um, and it's and it's and it's cloaked in other ways. It's cloaked with you know local decision making things at the state level in the United States. You know, we get to decide what our school children are going to learn, and yeah. it's not always a good thing. You know what you just reminded me of? This it's pretty crazy. Like, all right, America and China were very different, okay? But if I, I was just reading the Tao Te Ching a couple days ago, and one of the things written, you know, by Lao Tzu, like I don't know, like two thousand years ago, maybe more, was you do like it, the summary was you do not want to have an informed population. You want them to be physically strong and mentally docile. And I mean, holy crap, it's like, like, and I feel like that's happening in America. You know, oh, or it's happened. It's happened. happened. It's like the failed education system allows people to be so easily influenced and not just on the right, on the left too. It's like you have the light, right and the left. They're so divided. They won't talk to each other. It doesn't matter what's true. It just matters what you could say louder and more offensive. And I've, I've encountered this with just growing up. Like, I remember when I would argue with people, not even argue, I would just try to have a discussion and they would disagree with me vehemently enough. And I would be like, oh, wait, no, 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 I'm just saying this thing. And maybe, and I would just in my head be like, maybe this person just has a perspective I don't. Maybe there's information that they have that's valid that I don't. And I would just listen and try to, you know, like try to have like a, a two way street, a two way flow of information. And so many times I would get disappointed because there was no, you know, there wasn't any reciprocation of actual information. It was just insults. It's because I said something that triggered their their sense of identity, be they on the right or the left, and there's no longer a discussion. And I feel like that's pervasive in this country, you know? And it's like, people think that because they go, they're going to school or they're in college that they are more well-informed. And it's like, I don't know. No, I don't know anymore. It's like, I, I got, so I have, um, you know, one of my, I have a master's degree in like statistics. Okay. So analytics, whatever, but it's like, that's useless. If I don't apply it every day, it's useless. If I am not looking at stats and charts every day and like honing it, you know, so it doesn't matter what, it doesn't matter what your degree is in or what your concentration or what your education. It's like, how are you applying what you've learned on a day-to-day -day basis? And I think that's not that. I think that's unfortunately rare in today's society. This, this ties in to um, a project I'm going to start working on soon. I'm developing with a friend about how news is shared or mm -hmm. made, how in, you know, insights, mm -hmm. people want to be entertained mm -hmm. and there's, there's money in the people that are watching this infotainment and a culture of really funded and supported and, and steadily supported news and journal, journalism needs to be on the order of the day again. Because only if journalists can do proper reporting and journalism and also educate people, then we're going to have a more informed society. But yeah. how, sorry, no, go ahead. I interrupted. No, um, how? Yeah, how, I, how because you have the moneyed interest that doesn't want people to know what's actually going on or, or how to deal with it. So it's like, it's great and I would support it. But when you have people who have, let's say trillions of dollars of, of power at their disposal, how do you, how do you make that viral enough for everyone to be like, heck yeah. Because if you get like, I look at the, if you get people outraged enough, it, it can actually push through. You need you need viral outrage to combat establishment resources devoted against you. I think that it should be a part of healthy democracy and people yes. understanding it. There are models and people are always suspicious of the BBC or Deutsche Welle or um, other countries that have as part of their democratic identity mm -hmm. uh, free and supported type of journalism. And it's, 
is then these journalists that don't have to write to get clicks. It's yeah. these editors that don't have to write the headlines to outrage people and, and their metrics aren't going to be judged on, you know, uh, how many site visits or whatever. It's simply going to be the quality of journalism and they're going to have jobs that, you yeah. know, pay them well, because it's, uh, this, this is the problem. And what you were talking about is, you know, you study statistics, I studied political science, but when it comes to politics, you know, yeah. politics is, 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 it means of the people. It's a study of how people sure. uh, make rules for themselves and everyone should be able to talk and participate in that. And yeah. keeping yeah. down and not well informed is a way to control them. So, how would it get funded? Because I, I think, I mean, it's great. Well, but, I mean, like... Okay. I mean, in the United States, no one even wants to fund health care and people manage, <laughs> right? How would it get funded? Um, there's a tax in Germany. Anyone yeah. that owns TV or radio has to register and pay a tax. Okay. People complain about it, but you always have access to information that you know you can trust. Even though it's government funded, it's absolutely independent. Mm. Oh, oh no. Oh no, the live is paused. Did I lose you? Uh, no, you okay. did not lose me. Oh, okay. I don't, don't worry. Can you hear me? Okay. Is it on again? I don't yeah, know you're what on. to do. You're on. You're good. I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay. I, I hear you. Wait, 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 put your camera. There okay. we go. Can you see me? No, ah, I'm back. I got okay. a call. Um, th no, there, there are models for this, but people have to say, I want this. And unfortunately in the United States, we have this situation where people are constantly complaining about how U.S. policy is helping other people. Sure. And they should, they should help people at home. Okay. But these same people that complain about this aren't voting for policymakers yeah. that want to help people at home. Yes. So yeah. you can cut down any argument right now when someone says, you know, why would we spend money, you know, somewhere else? And you know, why not? Yeah. And, well, it's... It, it's like, are you like, that's so that's, that's the funny thing. Um, whenever I, I even hear that in person, I'm like, are you voting locally? Like, do you like, do you vote? Do you vote for Senate elections? Do you vote? Do you vote for congressional elections? Or do you just vote for the president? Because if that's all you're doing, then you're not going to be heard. You don't matter. And, but then there's, a, I think there's a, there's an intentional system against that too. I think there's an intentional system to, to get people to think that it's pointless to vote. Because if you have the majority of the population who think it's pointless to vote, then who's the one who votes? People with extreme agendas. And mm. most of them are conservatives. Yeah. It's it's almost like it's we're feeling intentionally worthless, meaningless, and overwhelmed. And then it's we don't... Aimed. That feeling is aimed. And it's up to people to kind of, you know, like get them... Like, not get themselves out, but we we do have to come up with something to get them more active. You know, oh, I've got something. I've got something. I'm working on it. Um, I find when I look at how to get people to get active in something, it's overwhelming. You know, you don't know if if you do this, but but is it is it environmentally sound? And mm. you know, they maybe p politically support this, but but you know, the the working conditions isn't there. Sometimes you just need to start with one thing, one simple thing. And then you practice your agency, your political agency. And, you know, I got these books behind me. There's mm. these political theories about human life and the yeah. value of human, uh, value of being a human. And this is why democracy works because you give part of your agency, your power to an elected official. And only by giving that power to them did they have a mandate to make rules. And we've lost this sense of yeah. agency. So I mean, I'm working on products, projects right now about um, companies that are still selling, uh, uh, making a profit in Russia. And it's not about pharmaceuticals. It's not about baby food. It's about things like shampoo and face cream. It's um, fast moving consumer goods. That's something I look at because nobody needs Pantene shampoo yeah. to stay alive in Russia. Yeah. No kid needs to eat. I just did a video about Ritter Sport. You know, no kid needs to eat Ritter Sport chocolate. And yeah. 
these companies that are still active in Russia are paying taxes there, and these taxes then are going to support you know this this illegal yeah. And um, I just pick one thing every once in a while, and I just don't buy it anymore. And it's a way of feeling empowered and not overwhelmed. And when people ask me what I can do, I say, don't buy Pantene shampoo. Done. Yeah. It shouldn't have to be hard. It yeah. shouldn't have to be hard to do the right thing. And so start yeah. small. And then you kind of almost can build up the, oh, yeah, oh, there was this website where I, I trust and I informed myself that I don't want these products. And every there's enough research, there's enough research that'll show you that sanctions and boycotts do or don't yes. work. But yeah. if we go down to the lower level, they work for the people who yeah. feel like it's important. And, and they it, connect people because yeah. if you're doing something, if you're taking action, you know, because of a connection to a higher ideal, I think that that, that has like unspoken benefits, yeah. you know, like people, I, people ask me too, like, what can I do? And my thing is just like, be as self-sufficient as you possibly can. That's my thing is like, just, you know, yeah. Like don't buy Pantene Pro-V shampoo, buy, buy like something that's cheap and maybe cl the closest thing to local that you possibly can buy local, maybe try to find your own local chocolate shop or just something like if you, if like, you know, because if you're, if you do try to just like be, if you try to cut costs to be as like, I guess, you know, uh, I don't want to say off the grid because I'm not off the grid, but if, but if you do try to cut a lot of unnecessary expenditures and if you doing that is actually boycotting something kind of rotten and evil, then like you're saving money because you're cutting expenditures, but you're also helping something greater, you know? And it's this disassociation, this loneliness also that's affecting societies around the world. Yeah. And we're so connected, but we're so lonely. Yeah, and doing something to be part of something bigger than you too also has a lot to do with democratic resilience. I think and religion does that. Religion helps a lot of people with that. You know, I just wish there was a there was a better kind of religion that <laughs> didn't rely on. You know, yes, we're all a part of something, but we ostracize the other. Yeah, it's the otherness, and this is why I make a point when I'm talking about things not to and let's let's be honest um everyone is an other something in someone else's eyes yeah yeah and it's not necessary <sighs> okay wait so i'm gonna do a completely uh, different subject Art, you, you brought this up okay. you brought this up and i wanted to talk the indian elections so mm. i mean no one doubted that modi was gonna get reelected. i mean right like it's just right i mean there was no doubt. The question was, how much of a mandate would he get? The polls had been showing that the BJP, which had been in power yeah. since, I think, 2010, um, was going to win. Mm -hmm. But India, a good resource is Freedom House. They have a democracy rating, and mm -hmm. they use a criteria to mark how democratic um, a country is. Yeah. And if you look at India's rating over the past 10 years, you'll see that it has been getting lower and lower. You know, 10 years ago, I think uh, Russia was at a, a 17 or a 19. Today, they're at a 13. Um, they're not considered free at all. India, of course, is still a democratic country. It's the right. largest democracy in the world. But um, there are some things that have been really problematic. The BBC offices had to close down. They now have a completely new format because um, there was a documentary that was aired in the UK about Modi's uh, role in, in riots um, mm -hmm. where um, Muslims died years ago. And that was shown in the UK. Yeah. And uh, coincidentally, then BBC's offices are rated for tax reasons. And this, um, there had been um, some anti-Muslim uh, rhetoric. And you have to keep in mind that India is so large. I think um, the country is the, has, has the second largest population of Muslims also in the world. Yeah. But because there's so many there, um, the, the, you know, the Hindus are obviously in the majority. And, sure. um, you know, TikTok isn't allowed in India. 
Yeah. And I just did a video about the election results and it's not going to get a lot of traction because of that. But yeah. the same video on Instagram um, was very active in the comments. Oh, uh, I'll follow you on Instagram. Okay. Oh, I, I have you on That's Twitter. That's Socracy yeah. too on Instagram. Got it. And um, it's, it's interesting to see also how different uh, groups react differently yeah. on um, the, the demographics from the apps, especially when you're talking about, about um, uh, things in countries and borders and things like that that aren't welcome on certain apps. And um, the thing about the Indian election is Modi, Modi's party won, yeah. but there is uh, an opposition that was created and there was a tone that was set saying we don't want to give him an absolute pass and the it wasn't a landslide victory for him like many expected so um there are analysts that say that you know he's got to come down from his political pedestal and by coming down he's going to be more within the reach of the average Indian that wants more freedom of the press is unhappy with some of his economic policies. Um, apparently he botched COVID in some people's opinions, you know, how he reacted. I, I, I don't know anything about presidents of, of my country doing that. Oh, wait, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, hold on. Hold on. Wait, I got to fix something. All right. Hold on. Oh, CyberDoc is here. Okay. There we go. Sorry about that. I, uh, I just, uh, the, 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 I got an inactivity warning, so I had to, you know, do something. Like, I had to, you know, move the puzzle piece. Oh, because they didn't want you just to, I see. I never do live. Years ago, years ago, when I started, before before the, the when I was still living in Kiev, sometimes on a Friday night during COVID, I would pour myself a glass of red wine mm. and go live. And, you know, it, it after the war started, I just... Drinking a glass of wine wasn't fun anymore to sit there. So yeah. this is actually the first live I've done in like two years. Well, I'm so glad to be the the, the one to christen you uh, out of your uh, out of your live seclusion. Well, you know, I, I don't get asked to do much because people are like, "Oh, Dr. K is so serious, and she's busy working during you know." And I do have a day job, but I was so thrilled when you asked. You'll have to have me. You'll have to have me back. I will. Oh, no. Like, the thing is, like, I, I, you know, my goal is to just be interviewing, like, experts in the field. That's, that's what I want. You know, like, I used to just do live streams of me talking, and they would do all right. But like, I'm like, okay, I'm, I'm a lot of times I'm saying the same thing. Or I just get some, like, you know, unintelligent Trumpers going, drop 2024. It wasn't an insurrection. And it's like, I don't know. That's not, you know, and it's like, I, I think my live streams would be much more constructive if I just spoke to experts in, in their field. And that's, that's I, if I have my way, I'll be doing this every day, like five days a week. Yeah, it's it's also, um, when you do an interview, you learn something from the other person. Oh my God. That's, why, that's yeah. why I love doing interviews. You can ask questions and um, it was, and now can I ask some questions? Can Me? we turn yeah. this around? Yeah, uh, okay. So, sure. How long have you been doing your TikTok? Oh, uh, I started as a crypto guy in June of 2021 because I really love the idea of bankless of bankless systems because I think the banks are corrupt, evil scum. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah, and uh, you know, I have very mild, moderate views. You know, <laughs> um, so I just love I love the idea of um, something called smart contracts where a contract is able to be conducted between two parties without them ever meeting. And if it's, if it's under, you know, like blockchain, then it's secure and it's immutable. So anyway, I did that. And then around 2022, um, I was getting censored for almost all of my posts and I did, I wasn't even like, buy this. It's so great. You know, like, and then I, but I just started to get all this bad news just people were saying oh the dollar's gonna crash oh the the global system's gonna collapse oh this bad thing and finally i was like no so i just started debunking a lot of that nonsense and then my page just took off i went from having like 20 something thousand to like fifty thousand very quickly and and i was like i like doing this better anyway because um so many scumbag crypto bros started coming into the space and they really dirtied, you know, the like 
you know, they dirtied the name crypto. Now people see crypto, they're like, eh, you know, and I understand why, even though I'm very, I'm a, I'm an avid fan of, of certain blockchains. So, uh, and I, so I started doing just world commentary stuff around 2022, like, you know, like around May of 2022, like June, 2022, little bits here and there. But that, I'm so flattered that you had a question for me. I'm just a, I'm just a commentator. But what do you think about um, the role of, of the citizen journalist? I think, um, you know, if you want to go to ideals, like and I, I'm a bit of an idealist. I think if you are supplying information to people, you have a duty to make it, to be honest. You have a duty to provide the facts to the best of your ability. And it's also your duty to have what you're saying be easily verifiable. Yeah, you know, that sounds, you and I, we're twins there. It's uh, <laughs> because sometimes I get criticized for the newspaper articles that I show cre screenshots of, but I always try to pick sources that people can find without paywalls. Yeah. Yeah, same. That's like any, almost, almost any fact I'm stating, like I have a background photo of like the, the actual stat or fact or chart because I, I never, I don't want... I don't want people to get an idea or opinion just from my words. I, I, I just think, I just think you should be, you should just be saying stuff that's true and have it easily provable that you're telling the truth. Have you ever been wrong about something? Several times. Sure. Um, and how'd you handle it? I, I mean, I felt stupid, but I apologized. Like I was so happy. I'll, I'll give you, I could give you a couple examples of how I was wrong. Um, I saw something and I didn't verify it deep enough. I saw something about the Cyrus cylinder where it was, you know, uh, it was created during the times of Cyrus the Great of, in Persia around like 500 something BC or 600 something BC. And Cyrus is the guy who freed the Jews, you know, when he conquered Babylon, freed the Jews. And this, this guy who was a professor was saying on TikTok, oh, it's, it was the Persian Bill of Rights. And I looked up a couple sources you know, one of them from the UN showing the Cyrus Cylinder as a symbol of the Bill of Rights. And I did some more research and I'm like, oh, this is so great. Oh my God, look at ancient Persia. That was so amazing. They were a century ahead of the Romans with like the 12 tables. And, you know, they were like, China didn't have anything like that. You know, I don't, I still don't know if they do. <laughs> and so I made a post about that. I'm like, this is just so beautiful. Oh my God. And then I find out that wasn't true. You know, then, then, and I'm like, oh no, it was, it was a story that was pushed by Muhammad Pahlavi Reza Shah's wife. And I was like, oh man. So, you know, I, I took it down and I apologized and, you know, um, or, or sometimes I'll get like numbers of like debt percentages wrong. So one time I made a post about how America's debt to GDP ratio isn't as high as China's because, you know, but then I was wrong. And so I made a post like, I was wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> you I want... understand if you want to unfollow me. <laughs> you know, Do you, you got to want... admit you're wrong. Do you want to hear mine? Because yes. it's, Because I exactly the ones I was wrong on too. And it's, it's so good because you know where you were wrong because you try to be right all the time. That's a good sign. And you, yeah. everyone watching, that is a good sign. If Thank someone you. can tell you when they were wrong and, um, for me, it's um, it's calculations, and it had to do with troop movements of um, how much in the the spring offensive that was so slow moving in Ukraine, like how much land was lost, mm. and it was like some calculation about how many football fields, and I apparently know nothing about the size of football fields. <laughs> um, and um, the other one had to do, and this is it's also it's war related had to do with a bag of teeth that was found in a village in Ukraine. Oh. And as soon as this bag was found, the, um, the, um, the report started coming out that there had been torture. And, and it was reminiscent of, of another time in World War II where this was prevalent. And, and I was just, and I, I was angry and horrified and, emo and emotional. Yeah. And I didn't fact check it. Yeah. And it turns out and it now this is the kicker of the entire story it turns out that it is very common for dentists and veterinarians to keep teeth when they pull them 
this is something I did not know. And in my comments, um, it was addressed. So I was like, hey, I'm a veterinarian. You know, when we pull, we, we keep the teeth, you know. We, I don't know. We just don't throw them away. And there was someone that said, you know, my dad was a dentist for, for 40 years. And he had, you know, a, a jar full of teeth. And apparently, this is what had happened. Um, a, a, a retired dentist's house had been looted. And he had had like 40 years of teeth and the bag or jar was taken because they had hoped to find gold fillings in them. Um, the Russian troops that had been looting. And then when the Ukrainian troops came in and they found this bag of two teeth, they, they thought the most terrible thing. And because it's Russia and obviously confirmation bias, I yeah. should know better. Right. No. Yeah. Oh. It's the emotions. Yeah, absolutely. It's confirmation bias. It's being emotional. For me, it's sometimes being too hopeful. Yeah. You know, I'm always looking for like the good. You know, it's like, it's like, oh, no, you know, this is it. Okay, fine. And, and I'm not as like, I'm, I'm not as ferocious in, in cross referencing. You know, well, you know that's, that's, that's the omission, right? This is how when uh, um, you see this a lot in people in our roles that are taking on a little bit of citizen journalism, sort of this, yeah. this um, edu scrolling, you know, trying to catch people and pick them up where they are. That there, there can also be that bias of omission, right? Yeah, yeah, and you don't even know you're doing it sometimes. Like sometimes I'll I'll make a post and I'll watch the post and I'll be like, oh, this is great. But then after the third time, I'm like, oh no. Oh no, I missed this. I should have said this. Oh no. You know, and then it's like, what did I do? Then I'm like trying to go in the comments, like I meant to say this thing and but it doesn't get like it gets drowned out by all the by all the other comments and I'm like, oh no. But you know, but sometimes, you know, like tell me if you've witnessed this, like sometimes I'll make a post about something that I'm fairly well versed on. And then because if, if I if I leave out important details or that, that I just didn't even know, I get corrected. So I have learned so much just by being wrong or not saying enough and getting corrected. I have such a rich comment section. <laughs> I, 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 have, yeah. I have no idea how t TikTok does not know where I am. Mm -hmm. uh, my account region is Ukraine for some reason, and I have never been able to change it. Wow. And um, I have really a global following and that means people are bringing insights into the comments and you have people that i say you know oh yeah i i'm from south africa and this is this is how yeah. we experience you know the BRICS meeting or you know i'm from finland or i'm from hungary and yeah. you know or, or people in, in in Moldovia. It's oh, someone finally did some content on Transistria. Thank you, Dr. K. And then they talk yeah. about um, things that you know we might not be able to pick up on the uh, on the media or when we're looking at the AP ticker or when we're trying yeah. to cross things. You have people that are just saying, okay, yeah, I, I was at the protest today or something like that, and that's been really interesting. But I. I, you and I both know people can be ugly on social media. Yeah, of but, course, because it's anonymous. But as a woman, I get some really strange stuff. Oh, yeah. I, and it, it's not necessarily sexualized. It's, it's maybe yeah. a, a, a attacking, but it's interesting. Um, I, I have to deal a lot with, with input from trolls and troll activity. Oh. And, and it goes in phases. And yes. it's so interesting because, as you know, after um, Prigozhin and you know left yeah. the vibe of his troll farms in St. Petersburg closed down, yeah. they started opening up or or expanding troll far troll farms in Africa, and there was a connection. And some wow. of the actually reflected some different cultural nuanced things. I get and that too. Yeah, I get I get so many African trolls. You know, and and I'm like, okay. I mean, I don't know. I, I'm actually very pro Africa. I think the next Renaissance like is going to happen in Africa. It may take a century, but I think Africa is going to is going to be like very pivotal in the direction that the world goes. You know, in the coming decades. Um, but that's like I get like like I said, out of if I get a hundred comments, eighty of them will be like "f you," "screw you," "we hate you," and then you know. 
15 will be like, thank you so much. This is really great. And then heart, 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 because you know, I yeah. try to report positive behavior. If you write something nice in my comments, you'll get a heart. Yeah, yeah, S same here. Yeah, you get something, you know, but like, unfortunately, sometimes I just don't have time to read the comments because I'll just have so many coming through. Like, but the funny thing is I'll get crazy amounts of comments, but my views will not grow. Like I, like I got 50 shares yesterday for one of my posts in an hour, 50 shares in an hour. Like generally when that happens, it'll blow up to like a few hundred thousand views by the end of the day um, or, or within 24 hours. But ever since I, I criticized TikTok's efforts to um, prevent the ban, I've noticed. Yeah, uh, you are not. What is that usually gonna? It's gonna take maybe maybe four months, four weeks or something. Um, been months. You know, it's it's. You might have to do a little bit of a hard pivot, change your content for a while. Uh, no... I'm gonna keep doing what I'm doing. It's like. Yeah, I mean, but maybe the topics. There's there's been so much um so much about Ukraine creators being shadow banned and things like that and. Mm -hmm this isn't always a rewarding yeah. hobby right um yeah. i i i do it to feel like you know I, I'm, I'm helping people um yeah and you know to feel more better informed and and you know this whole resilient society the democracy thing is, is important for me uh and it's just it's it's you're in it for the long haul sometimes. Yeah, that's it. It's like they can keep punishing me, but I'm still going to be making my content. You know, I'm, if if my heart is telling me that hey, this is something that should be said, then 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 do it. You know, and like the thing is, even though sometimes my messages are harsh, I I do always try to like show that you know, there like you there's always hope, and it is it is not as bad as ever as everyone making it seem. You know, unless it's like, like at least when it when it comes to like the American quality of life, but like when it comes to Ukraine, it's freaking horrible. Like it is horrible what Russia is doing, and I I'll never I'll never ever put a positive spin on that. You know what I mean? I think, um, you know, I think that we really need to understand just the the devastation that is being wreaked or wrought or I no no if I'm using the the correct wrought wrought wrought. Okay, there you go. I sound poetic, um, and. I think one huge failure of the United States, and I think it's intentional, is that you, the United States could have ended this war within a few months. Like when, when Ukraine resisted the first assault from Russia, like we could have sent lethal aid, we could have sent F-16s and everything right then and there and stopped Russia dead in their tracks. We could have done it in 2014. We could, like we should have, we should have done it in 2014, and I'll go be even more bold, we should have done it when Russia entered Georgia in 2007 the bush administration should have like that nope no you know because this all every time we relented and did not respond with deadly force or or by offering deadly force it just emboldened putin yeah there there was a lot of testing and yeah. failed the test i i don't think america should go it alone anymore though and i, I think agree. i think there shouldn't be any unilateral decisions yep it was really difficult to build consensus. And you had so many different, you had the UN, you had the EU, you had, you know, the partners and allies. And the Ramstein format has been good for coordinating military and other aid. It's, um, but cons that, that's the thing. Democracy is like sausage bit making. And so is consensus building. But now, we are so interconnected now. You were talking mm -hmm. about, us, you know, with with uh, what, what is it, rare earths and and mm -hmm. micro things like that. The reason the U.S. is doing that is because they realize how dependent they were on China, right? Mm -hmm. Taiwan but, too. Taiwan okay. is well, yeah. Ta China and Taiwan. You're right. Well, at least, ah, oh no, with uh, rare earths, we were so dependent on China. Yeah. And it's um, we have to face the fact that we're interconnected, and what happens affects our neighbors and the rest of the world. Yeah. So we have to consensus. Um, and breaking down this consensus and polarizing hybrid warfare, right? I mean, as Russia had already invaded Georgia and was yeah. had annexed Crimea, the next move was Brexit. And by influencing that, weakening the EU. And 
also now this testing constantly, these missiles that fly into Polish airspace. And, you know, this plausible deniability, because once it was a Ukrainian missile that yeah. every, now the Russians say it could be Ukrainian. And that yeah. used to be a NATO Article 5 moment. And, you know, I mean, it's testing NATO, right? Yeah. And it's it's like, you know, the, any, any type of, you know, when you test power and power doesn't deliver, then there was never power there. And yeah. this is what this is what Putin is trying to show when it comes to, you know, international rules and how the national community works. Like you can't enforce it, so we're just going to do what we want. I think, though, I, this is where I think that the U.S. is much more devious than everyone gives them credit for. Like I think, I think that we could have ended the war in Ukraine, but we didn't because we want to exploit Ukraine for its resources. And the more desperate Ukraine is for our aid then the more we can exploit Ukraine, you know, to get like to get the natural gas contracts, to get oil from Russia. But then we also get the benefit of a weakened and depleted Russia. You know, and yeah, you don't know who's going to fill that vacuum, right? Because oh, in, in, yeah, that's that's the funny thing. Yes. If Putin goes, who takes over for Putin? That's... Yeah. Who's strong enough to rise to the top? of that, can I say shit show? I don't know if that's allowed. Um, who, who's, whoever is strong enough to rise to the top of that situation has characteristics very much like Vladimir Putin. Yeah. And as, as much as people are sad that um, the, the Putin adversary, you know, balance, Alexei Navalny has yeah. died. Yeah he also had very nationalistic positions yes yeah. yeah he was a crazy he was a crazy too and for and it's like it's like don't rise don't raise that man to sainthood i'm pretty sure he was like quite racist quite and quite homophobic like a lot like he just it's like okay fine he could be a contester for putin but it's just okay that's a more cooperative sociopath versus the soci sociopath in power now don't sanctify him you know it yeah, and okay. As as for resources, I mean, the Nord Stream pipeline. Mm. Trump Trump was against it. They wanted to they wanted to bring in U.S. Uh, LNG um, that was going to help a group of people in the United States. Um, Ukraine as a transit land, um, having leverage over over Russia, and you know, really sitting basically mm. faucet for Europe. Uh, I, Ukraine's always been a buffer and yeah. it's a pawn historically, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. It, um, it wouldn't surprise me if the United States has, has calculated the loss of yep. parts of Ukraine. And this really? is, I'm saying for the first time out loud to a oh. large people, it, it wouldn't surprise me. Um, there was always this talk at the beginning of the war that the war would end with, um, and sweet spot isn't the right word for it, but when Russia runs out of money mm. and Ukraine runs out of hope mm -hmm. and soldiers, and because um, they're, they're going to fight until they run out of that, the Ukrainians, and Russia will fight. Russia doesn't care about loss of life. Oh, That's they don't. Different cultures, a different priority. They yeah. don't care about that. It's it's the war. It's the money that's going to make the difference for Russia. Can I add on to like how much Russia doesn't care about their soldiers? So my wife's grandfather was was in you know some, one of the, some of the Russian lands that Germany took, and the German soldiers were stationed amongst the Soviet populace. You know, like in 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 where they were, because the Russian the Germans were like, oh yeah, the Russians they're not going to bomb their own people. They absolutely did. The Soviets just bombed everyone. They just wiped out half the village. They didn't care that they killed their own people. They just wanted, it was like, get the enemy. Doesn't matter where the enemy is, just get them. And that is, that is just the Russian way. And, and when, when, I, when I hear people try to speak about like a Russian respect for life, I'm like, that's non-existent. Maybe the Russian person, like, you know, Russian people, sure. But when it comes to Russian leadership, there is no regard for Russian life. Yeah. I I, unfortunately, I, I I didn't even realize. I have to go. I have to pick up my kids from school. Oh, that's right. You're in a different time zone. And before my daughter walked in and that cutout was my husband trying to get in touch with me. So 
Thank you very this much. This is great. Thank this you. Thank you. And I'm going to post this on YouTube in a couple of days. So is that okay? I have a YouTube channel too. So maybe like, I don't know, we tag or something. Yes. I yes. Yes. Well, well, I'll try to figure it out too. Cause like when, when it comes to YouTube, I'm like, where are my hands? I don't know. Where are my feet? I don't get it. You know, just, okay. So form development, cross platform yes. development. I'm it. working on it, Dr. K. Okay. <laughs> Um, All right, thank you so much. Everyone that was with us, and thank you, and have a great time picking up your kids from school. Okay? Thank you. Thank you. You take care. Thank you. Bye, Bye everybody.